Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Uh, I'm excited to be here this morning. We're just gonna work through it. It's gonna be fine. We're gonna enjoy it together. Uh, I, uh, I have no idea where I'm starting this morning, so let me circle back my brain. Yeah, can we just, let's just start this whole, I'm just kidding. No, we're good. So back in January of this year, uh, my dad invited my son and I to go on this really weird, odd thing called uh, the Pennsylvania Farm Show. Anybody ever, anybody ever been there today? I want to know who I'm offending. Awesome. Nobody. All right, cool. Uh, so nobody's going to be offended. It's super, um, so I lived in South Carolina the last 13 years before we moved back up here, and this kind of like put that to shame. Like, this was where all of the people that have beautiful rednecks go to like look at stuff. So tractors, uh, animals just walking about. Uh, it's really weird. But the cool thing was at the end of the whole thing, there was this thing called a horse pool. What they would do is they'd put two big horses and they would attach them to this sled. And then they'd put concrete blocks on the sled, and then they would try to get the horse to pull the sled as far as it could possibly go. Uh, 15 feet, I think, is the limit. And once it hits that 15 feet mark, then they call it and they bring out the next two horses. And then those two horses pull, and then it just kind of continues in a cycle. Now, what's crazy is they use these horses called draft horses. Now, I'm going to sound super educated. Understand, I'm just better at Google than some of you, all right? But draft horses, uh, there's a couple of different you know, types of them. Basically, the three major ones that you would know are like Clydesdale horses, Belgian horses, Shire horses. These are uh, big, massive, burly horses. These are what real men ride like into battle, right? Uh, these uh, horses are stout. By themselves, they can pull upwards of 8,000 pounds. By themselves. All right, yeah, I know. Put a second horse with it. And you think, great, 16,000 pounds, false. They can pull upwards of 32,000 pounds. There's two little horses. They're not little, but two horses pulling along over 32,000 pounds. In 1924, it was noted that two Shire horses pulled 45 to 50 tons, just two of them by themselves, pulling 45 to 50 tons, almost 100,000 pounds more than a semi-truck. Why would I share that? Because the horses and the farmers understand that these horses work stronger together than apart. What they can accomplish together is far greater than what they ever could accomplish on their own. We've been going through this series called Running with Giants, and we've been talking about uh, all these different giants of the faith, and we based it around this kind of one key verse in the book of Hebrews. I want to read it for us one more time this week. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that, sh that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, the reason why this verse matters is that each one of us are on a race. We're on a, a course we call life. And around us are these witnesses, these people who have already done life before us. And what we've been doing over the last seven weeks is calling out to those people in the Bible and saying, hey, you're a giant of the faith. If you could come down and share uh, some wisdom with me, what would it be? And so today we end with uh, two massive giants in Paul and Timothy. So what would Paul and Timothy have to say to us? I think they would say, don't do life alone. I think if Paul and Timothy were to come down and talk to you and me, I think they would say, don't do life alone. You know, there are a lot of things within the Christian faith that are singular in nature. Maybe we read our Bible alone. Maybe we pray alone. We spend time meditating or fasting alone. Like these are all good practices. 
But God didn't create us to be alone. He created us to thrive within relationship. And so this morning, I want us to walk through some really important things that I think are going to help us understand why community matters. Because everyone, young, old, single, married, needs community. We need community. Not like friendships. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about true and genuine community. So what does that look like for you and I? Well, that's where I want to take us this morning. Because the stark reality of our culture is that you and I are more prone to loneliness than fulfillment. Cigna, the medical company, just did a study that said that over half of Americans feel currently or have felt feelings of loneliness, distance. If you were just go on Google and type in loneliness, you would have something like this pop up. All of these different articles. Loneliness in America is a public health problem. Cigna finds more evidence of loneliness in America. Americans are a lonely lot, and young people bear the dot, 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 that's heaviest burden. Feeling alone in America, study finds loneliness epidemic in America. Half of Americans feel lonely, study finds. Many Americans are lonely, and Gen Z the most of all. We, as a country, feel alone. I think this is perfectly displayed in a dinner that one of my friends saw happen on Friday night. On Friday night, he, called, or he texted me, he's like, man, you're never going to believe what I just saw. This mom and her son were out on a really cute mother-son date. And I'm like, man, that's great. He's like, yeah, yeah. The mom was on her phone the entire time with a computer in front of her, typing out whatever notes was the person on the other line, saying all the while the son was attempting to tell her about his day. Like, this is what I did. This is where I went. This is what I accomplished. And you could tell this total disconnect between mother and son. There is a sense that this generation feels alone. I don't bring my phone out here, but one thing uh, leadership expert Simon Sinek says is if you have your phone in your hand when talking to somebody, you immediately let them know that they aren't the most important person in the room. There's an immediate disconnect. So in a generation where we are more connected than any other generation, we are more disconnected. Frieda from Reichman, who is, uh, an, uh, was a fantastic psychologist, an innovator, and really changed the landscape of psychology, says this, that real loneliness is really just the want for intimacy. Now, before I get too far, I want to make sure that we understand what intimacy is. I'm not talking about, you know, like, ow, chicka, wow, wow. You know what I'm saying. I know what I'm saying. I'm saying that because there's kids in the room, right? You know what I'm talking about. That is not intimacy. That is the product of intimacy, but it is not intimacy. Intimacy is what happens before you get there. It's what makes that awesome. You checking with me? Cool. So what does intimacy look like? How do we find it? How do we fight against loneliness? Well, we have to understand what true community is. And this is the most important piece. See, in the beginning, God created us from community for community. When God created you and I, triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and I wish I had time to lay that out for you this morning, but I don't. And if you'd like to know more about it, I'm happy to meet you at the Green Wall. But triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, create the world. You see that in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. But then there's a very specific line in Genesis 1.26 that God says that kind of cues us in that God is three and yet one. Check out what he says in Genesis 1.26. He says, let us make man in our image. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So first person, plural nouns, right? So Father, Son, Spirit create all things in perfect community. They have no need for anything else. Because they are perfectly unified and have perfect community. And they create us, humankind. And they realize humankind is not healthy to be alone. So look at Genesis 2, 18. It says, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper, right, who is just right for him. And God makes Eve. So God recognizes it is not good for you to be alone. It's not good for you and I to be alone. We have 
a, a need, a, a desire within us for perfect community. And before sin entered the world, we had that with God. But something happened, right? Adam and Eve were told, don't eat this fruit. They eat this fruit. Next thing you know, sin shattered community. Sin destroys community. The community that was perfect between us and God is now broken. And when that happens, everything goes wrong. And I don't think you don't even have to be a Christian in the room to recognize today that sin destroyed the world. You can look at the families that are falling apart. You can look at the division in this nation between race, politics, economy. You don't have to even believe in this church thing to go, yeah, this world is broken. And sin is what did that. We see in Genesis 3.8, right after they, they sin, they've eaten the fruit, God comes into the garden. They hear him coming, and then they do something. They hide. Like a, like a kid hiding when he knows he's done something wrong, Adam and Eve hide from the God who they had perfect community with, who they used to walk through the garden with. Now that community is broken, and so they hide. But luckily, it doesn't stay that way. Because Jesus enters the scene. And Jesus enters the scene and recreates, restores what's been broken. He recreates the community that was intended to be between us and God. His death and his resurrection restores the relationship that was intended to be. And because of that restoration, we now have hope for that. And so we see now Paul and Timothy responding in that. Because see, the vertical relationship that we have with God, well, that drives or ought to drive our horizontal relationship with one another. Because these relationships with one another, if not driven by this relationship with God, become faulty. And we'll see how in just a minute. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Paul and Timothy write this letter. And they write it to the church at Philippi that Paul had started a few years earlier. Philippi is a church who is struggling with community. They don't understand what it means. They don't understand how to do it. And so Paul gives them a few markers to understand what community is and how to live in it. And I want to share them with you this morning. Number one, Paul says that the first marker of true community is purpose. You see, the thing that all communities have in common is a singular focus, an intentional purpose. And Paul would say here in verse 2, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. You see, for Paul, the ideal setup is that we would be focused on one another. This uh, one another phrase that he uses is used over 60 times in the New Testament. The majority of those are Paul's words to, to love one another, forgive one another, care for one another, bear one another's burdens. He talks over and over and over again about the importance of being one another. This graphic hopefully will maybe show that a little bit better of all that Paul says. And there's this, there's this really crazy rule. If you've ever been on stage before, my brother and I for nine years traveled up and down the East Coast and did uh, this thing called improv comedy. If you don't know what that is, it basically is exactly what you think it is. We made stuff up and hope people laugh. It was super fun. However, there's a really important rule to improv comedy. And that is your goal on stage is to make the other person look awesome. So when you walk out on stage, I, my goal was to make my brother look awesome. And then when he would come out on stage, his goal was to make me look awesome. And that way, if we're not focused on ourselves, but focused on each other, when we come off stage, we're like those two horses pulling weight behind us, and we're carrying one another. We're not focused on ourselves, but we're each making each other look awesome. At the end of the day, we know that it's going to be incredible, because we're not focused on whether or not we look great, we're focusing on whether or not they look great. This is what Paul says. Your singular focus ought to be geared towards one another. Doesn't mean you don't take care of yourself. Do that. But he also says, take care of one another as well. So first he says, have a singular focus. Secondly, he says, to be humble. Directly in verse 3, right? Don't be selfish. 
Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. This is a really horrible one for me. Just to be super honest. I am not a humble person. And it, is, it takes a lot of very aggressive men to beat it out of me. Back in 2010, I walked up to a guy and I said, hey, I'm moving to Baltimore. I'm going to plant a church. How do you feel about it? He said, I think you need to sit down, shut up, and learn some things. I said, yes, sir. Because for me, I was like, well, I'm the man. I can do whatever I want. But it took humility. It took me understanding that I had to learn, that I had to grow, to be teachable, to be moldable. Paul says, be humble. It's hard for me to struggle with not impressing people, with not making sure my kids act a certain way, dress a certain way, have certain toys. It's hard for me to make sure that I'm trying to be humble, but also be awesome at the same time. Those are conflicting, like those are very conflicting natures. But this is why community matters. Because community puts us in place with people who are at different life journeys than us. And this is, I think, the most important piece. The slide you're about to see is, I think, the most important thing you could see today. That each of us kind of live our lives as a Barnabas. And as a Barnabas, we need two things to help us thrive in our lives. We need a Paul and we need a Timothy. Let me tell you what that means. A Barnabas is kind of a friend. They're the people you throw your arms around and take selfies with, right? These are your buddies. They probably hold you, hopefully hold you accountable. We're going to talk about what that means in just a minute. All right, but you also need a Paul in your life, somebody that you can look up to, somebody that's further along in the journey than you that you can learn from and grow from. You also need a Timothy, somebody that you're kind of pulling along with you. Now, if you look at me, you go, but I don't have either one of those. Let me help you out. If you need a Paul, find some people in this room who are further along in the spiritual journey than you. If you need help with that, head to the green wall, tell Cynthia, I need somebody more headed in the spiritual journey than me, and she'll hook you up. If you need a Timothy, if you're not pouring your life into somebody else, you are wasting it. Let's see what that means. We have a hundred and some children upstairs. We have a ton of students on the third floor that you can share your story with, that you can invest in, that you can be their paw for. People need to step up and to invest in the life of the Timothys that are sitting on the second and third floor. If you go, oh, my story doesn't need to be shared. I don't have a cool story. I just came to church and got saved. Or if you have an awesome story where you're like, man, I was totally in drugs and then God saved me, great. doesn't matter. Your story needs to be shared. The experiences that God allowed you to go through are for a purpose and for a reason. And somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody needs to hear your struggles. Somebody needs to hear your trials. And it's time for us, church, to step up and invest in this next generation rather than staring at our phones or doing whatever we want to do. We have to be humble and recognize that God has called us to something greater than ourselves. He's called us to this generation of students and kids who need to see people who love Jesus well, and that's our job. That's our mission. And so not only does he call us to be humble, and not only does he call us to have a purpose, but he calls us to be generous. Now, before you cling to your wallets too heavy, this is not a giving message. I don't give two rips about your money. This is what Paul says. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. It can be hard for me and you to commit when we don't really like to be around people, or when we're really guarded and cautious about what we share. But community is God's desire. And a sign of mature faith is generosity. Generosity in all fashions. Let me tell you what this means. My son, Aiden, is seven years old. When Aiden has a toy in his hand, guess whose toy that is? His. Even if it belongs to you, if it's in his hands, it's his, and you ain't touching it. He'll do this number right here. My toy. Not your toy. My toy. I'm like, dude, that's your sister's toy, man. Give her back the baby doll. Like, what are you doing? No, my baby. Like, first of all, I love the protector in you. Secondly, I hate the selfishness in you. Right? But he, in that moment, is not very generous. Right? Now, on the opposite side, growing up, I got to watch uh, my father, who I would still say today is one of the most generous men that I know, give up not just his money, but his time, his talent, everything that he had. 
And still today, my kids get to watch that. They get to see him be generous with his time. They get to see him sweat. They get to see him bleed to get something done for our house. They get to see him as he serves my mother. They get to see him as he gives his money and and buys them things. Like Those things are all great. But at the end of the day, if they only see his money and don't see him, it's a waste of time. Generosity doesn't matter if all you're doing is giving money to make yourself feel better. You've wasted your time and God's. God doesn't just want your money. He wants you. Your money is a great byproduct. However, he wants you. We need you to step up and to invest in people. And so I'm, I, and I'm not saying don't get, look, I'm Max in the room, if I say don't give your money, that's a terrible thing. I'm just saying... Money is not God's priority. He's not looking going, well, you invested in 200 people but didn't give a dime. Ugh. No, he wants both of those things should come out of your maturity in faith. I didn't like tithing. I'll be super real about it. Giving up money every single week doesn't sound fun to me. But the blessing that I receive on the other side of it is far superior to when I keep all my money. So he doesn't just tell us to be, have a purpose, to be humble, to be generous, but he gives us an example in Timothy's life. Look at verse 20 in chapter 2. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what's going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come. Paul notes a really important fourth aspect to community here. And this is the one that none of us like, if I'm going to be super honest about it. Because I don't really like it that much. But it's accountability. You see, he says that Timothy proved himself. That means that Paul held him accountable to accomplish a certain level of maturity before he entrusted him with something. See, ignoring this element is the main reason why a lot of small groups never actually experience true community. That's why some of you sit in life groups and still feel like you're lonely. Because instead of of transparency, you like superficial. See, you kind of enter into this pact of let's just everybody mind our own business we'll have great food together but I don't want to really get up in your grill about stuff and that kind of passivity is dangerous this morning uh just we have a meeting every morning before uh we come up here on stage at 7 45 and pray together and we talk about the morning and this morning Doug Cure who's one of our uh servant leaders uh called out uh Pastor Dustin He's like, hey man, um, hadn't seen you walking lately. What's up with that? Like, uh, I like, I was like, Doug, that's that's bold, man. Like in front of everybody, just calling this dude out for not walking. Like, and Dustin's like, I've been on vacation for the last two weeks, but like, here's like, you can see like where I walked. Here's my workouts. He's like, oh, okay, just making sure you're walking, bro. Like that is, like, I'm not talking like accountability doesn't have to be like, tell me all the things you looked at on the internet this week. Oh no, bro, calm down. All I'm saying is, if you don't have somebody in your life who you can be real with, and somebody in your life who can equally be real back, this is an important piece of the puzzle. If all you want is somebody to blow smoke up your rear, that's fine. Go to a little, you know, I don't know, go somewhere to do that. I don't know where they do that. If you have a place like that, let me know. That sounds great. I would love for people to just talk great about me the whole time. Right? But if you want true community then you have to have somebody that you can be real with. And here's what, like for me, there was was this this couple in South Carolina. We were in their group for three years, but they still invest in us to this day. And uh, their names are Rodney and Kathy. And Rodney and Kathy, the thing about Rodney was Rodney didn't know how to pull punches. So like we would sit in a coffee shop and I kind of like make a joke about Renee, like ha ha ha, and he'd look and be like, that's how you treat your wife, bro? Like, oh, uh, no, uh, no, 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 I love you, babe. You're the best. But we all need those people who, when we're acting stupid, can be like, hey, man, hey, girl, why are you being like that? Why are you going to that party? Why are you hanging out with those friends? Why are you skimping on your work? We all need people who can do that. 
But here's the deal. Church, we've got to be people who can receive that. Here's why. Because transparency is what leads to intimacy. And intimacy leads to true community. If we can't be transparent with one another, you're never going to be able to mature in your faith. If you can't be real with people and have people be real with you, then you're never going to find true community. And this is a real struggle for me. It's like personally. I, um, and as the students know this, I've told them from the stage before, I don't like people a whole lot. I know, I know so to stop judging, I feel all these judgmental looks right now. I'm just, stop it. I know I, what I do for a living is literally invest in people's lives. But I, I'm a really terrible friend. Like if you were to ask anybody who's my acquaintance, they'd be like, yeah, that dude's not real strong at that. But you know what? They're willing to tell me that. Or I would never get better at it. I'm not good at sending you texts like, how you doing? What's up? I'm not a small talk person. Like if you come in my office, I want you to tell me what you need, and then I want you to leave. <laughs> but that's not most people. Most people like to like come in and, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm great. Man, life has been really busy. Great, cool, me too. What's up? Oh, let me just share with you a couple things. I'm like, oh, like my inner, like my inside's like, ah! Oh! <laughs> right? But on the outside, I know the right thing to do is to actually invest in people's lives. Because when that happens, well, you tend to be a little bit happier, you tend to be a little bit more productive, and guess what? You tend to feel less lonely. For me, I have two people. And this week has been a lot better for me. Like just like on this loneliness battle. Because really like two guys that really have that ability to speak into my life are uh, Mac, CK, not double T, and, and my brother. And, and those two guys are guys who have freedom to go, that's stupid. You shouldn't do that. My brother will watch this message and then he'll call me. He'll say, hey man, here are 10 things you could do better next time. I'm like, well, I feel like that was a great, nope. Here are 25 things you can improve. Here's how you did this scripture wrong. Here's how you did, but if I don't have people like that speaking into my life or talk, calling me each week going, hey man, how are you loving your volunteers this week? Hey, how, how are you loving your students this week? See, if I don't have people like that in my life, then guess what? All of my volunteers wouldn't have my cell phone number and none of my students would know my name. Right? I would just be a mystery. I'm Pastor Steve. <laughs> right? Like, it's not even on the website. Like, so I need people. You need people. Maybe that's not your issue. Maybe your issue is very different than mine. But we don't have, we don't have people like that in our lives, then we are going to fail at growth. I want to invite the band to come back up as we kind of wrap up. There's a, a really great quote that my wife shared with me uh, just, just literally last night. And I shared with the staff uh, on Friday. I was like, guys, I just need y'all to pray. This is a, a really difficult message for me to prepare. I rewrote it four times because I hated it. Because I really, like, I, this is a real burden for, for me because I'm so, like, I'm so bad at a lot of this. And also, I'm so lonely more often than not. And so for me, like, this was just a really heart-wrenching message to write. And my wife knew it. So it was so bad the first time that she literally said, I would have fallen asleep during that message. I'm like, but I just, I don't want to talk about the real issues. I don't want to, I don't want to get in people's faces. She's like, but you need to. This is a quote she shared with me last night from Kay Warren. Uh, Kay says this, when we grasp how desperately we need each other, we can see that God has made provision not only for our loneliness, but also for the growth and well-being of the church. Our transparency, our true community, is what spurs the church on to growth. Our reservedness and our lack of transparency is going to be what stunts your ability to see God's best for your life. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know if you're like me or you just kind of feel like you're alone or maybe you don't. But if you do and you feel defeated, you feel alone, Come to Jesus. Let him fill you up with true joy. If this morning, if you don't feel alone, 
who just feel like I need to be doing something different with my life. I'm sitting on the fringes and I need to invest in people. I've wasted my opportunity to be a paw to somebody. And I appreciate you calling me out on that. And today I'm going to sign up for Kid Point. I'm going to sign up for a remix. I don't care what it is. I need you to get off the sidelines and get invested in somebody's life. Because they need you. They need you. God gifted you specifically to invest in somebody's life. And you sitting on the side only hinders his ability to use you. So church, wherever you're at, if you're struggling, or you just feel like, man, there's a, a void that I need to fill. Or maybe you just need somebody who can just invest in you. Maybe you're a new believer and you feel like you don't know anything about what's happening right now and you're super confused. We want to talk to you. When we sing these songs, get up, go out, find Cynthia and say, hey, this dude told me to come out here and talk to you. You don't have to remember, I don't care if you remember my name. Right, I'm hidden. I'm a, I, I'm a mystery. Steve, tell him Steve sent you. All right? Hey, go, get involved, get real. Be transparent. Allow God to work in your life in a way that you could never do alone. Be that pair of horses that can pull way more than you could ever pull by yourself. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I ask that you would be in this place this morning. Convict hearts. God, I just ask that you would work in a mighty way. I, I pray that you would start a revolution in this church. God, that there will be fights in the halls to get volunteers in the room. That they, they're going to be there. They're going to invest. God, that, that there would be an overrun of people saying, I want to invest in somebody. Put me to work. God, not because we need them, not because you need them, because they need one another. And together we are stronger than apart. So Jesus, we ask you would work in a mighty way. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.